Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you, Monsi Sese, and all of you for giving me uh, this opportunity to give a talk on uh, Professor Hajime Nakamura, and he is uh, in a way related to also Hagami Sensei, uh, and uh, as you know, I'm writing about uh, uh, Hagami Sensei, who was one of the leading uh, Tendai Buddhist figures uh, in the 20th century. So uh, let me explain, uh, let me start my presentation. So I, I would like to uh, talk about uh, Hajime Nakamura. Um, uh, he was a, a preeminent Japanese scholar of uh, Buddhology, Indology, and comparative philosophy. And while Nakamura made a series of uh, landmark achievements, really landmark uh, achievements in respective fields, the scope of his objectives uh, transcended the world of academia, and uh, he really tried to um, contribute to the enhancement of human coexist uh, coexistence across the world through his uh, sc uh, scholarly engagement. And this talk will uh, explore his vision of a uh, scholarship and uh, its uh, contemporary relevance. So I would like to cover three things. Uh, this is uh, uh, Professor Nak uh, Nakamura when he was a child. Um, number one, general remarks on Nakamura, uh, the person. Second, the scope of his uh, scholarly objectives. And thirdly, uh, contemporary re relevance of what he called universal ideas. So let me start with the first. Uh, who was uh, Hajime Nakamura? And, and there are many remarkable episodes of uh, Nakamura, of, of which I would like to uh, share just uh, th three things. Okay, number one, uh, episode number one, uh, Nakamura's uh, doct doctoral thesis. So Nakamura, mm, he, um, he wrote a dissertation uh, and he restored uh, the then forgotten 1000 history of Vedanta philosophy by examining texts in Sanskrit, Sanskrit, Greek, Chinese, and Tibetan. And this was really an achievement left even Indian scholars flabbergasted. And this was really unprecedented, or how do I say this? Uh, an achievement of unprecedented uh, magnitude, uh, achievement of unprecedented magnitude. And uh, uh, you, you see here, right, um, the English translation or the cover of the English translation of the second volume of his dissertation. And I, here I included a photo of a cart, a big cart. Why? Because um, his uh, dissertation was so, um, so uh, volum uh, voluminous, um, over 6,000 pages. So he needed to use this uh, cart to carry and submit it to the college. So that's episode number one. Episode number two, uh, Nakamura's uh, comprehensive dictionary of uh, Buddhist terms. So in 1947, still at the age of 35, Nakamura published a dictionary of Buddhist terms. And then next year, he started to revise or expand that project and uh, uh, which took uh, 19 years to complete. Uh, it consisted of uh, 30,000 entries, entries, 40,000 pages of manuscripts. And he gave the manuscripts to the publisher, but the publisher lost all of them. <laughs> so um, he spent another eight years and produced a work which consisted of so 45,000 entries, it's much, uh, uh, yeah, 1,005, uh, so uh, 15,000 more, ent more, more entries and 100,000 uh, 100, pages. And then he, he said, right, after eight years, spending another eight, eight years, as I redid everything, the end result turned out to be much better than the original one. <laughs> Episode number three, Nakamura's last lecture. So Nakamura died at the age of 87 and he was a teacher and a scholar to the end of his life. So during the final days of his life, uh, while he was in a coma and unconscious, 
uh, bedridden. Uh, people, people could see his right hand still moving. He was still writing unconsciously something. And then uh, at his home, while he was unconscious and uh, lying on the bed, he suddenly said, let's start today's lecture session. I am not feeling well, so please pardon me that I teach this way. And he was unconscious. And then uh, 45 uh, minutes or so, he gave a lecture. And then in closing, he said, it is a time to end today's session. Any questions? Now, there was only one, one person in the room, and that was a visiting nurse. So um, these episodes really show or capture some as uh, explain or elucidate who Nakamura was. Number two, I, I move to the second part, the scope of his scholarly objectives. Nakamura started out as a philologist, but around his mid thirties, he started to write also as an original independent thinker. And what uh, beneath this uh, transition was a certain sense of urgency. Um, so he wrote, um, through the development of technology, the world on its physical level has been integrated. On its internal level, however, the world has yet to be uni united at all. There are mutual suspicions among countries, clashes of competing ideologies and repressing boundaries. Resolving this cr a critical state of impasse isn't it the task of thinkers? In order to achieve the peace and welfare of all humanity, we must promote a mutual understanding among the peoples of the world. And this really captures uh, what Nakamura was getting at in the second half, half of his life. So, um, the, and the, this is what Nakamura really sought to do through his scholarship. In other words, to promote a wisdom shared by all humanity that transcends the divide between East and West. And as I see it, Nakamura was uh, deeply influenced and inspired by, at least in part, by a great contemporary Indian thinker, well versed in uh, the intellectual history of the East and the West and former president of India, uh, Sravepalli uh, uh, Radhakrishnan. In fact, at the age of 34, Nakamura published a book about the life and thought of Radhakrishnan. And uh, Nakamura himself noted, uh, you can see that on, uh, in the source number five, um, there is no better example, uh, just, uh, there is no better example than Radhakrishnan who lived as a living bridge uh, linking between the East and the West. And uh, perhaps you have, some of you have read uh, Radhakrishna's writings and Radhakrishna's major objective was to uh, contribute to what he called the emergence, emergence of a new civilization. And he writes, the prominent feature of our time is not so much the wars and the uh, dictatorships which have disfigured it, but the impact of different cultures on one another, their interaction and the emergence of a new civilization based on the truths of spirit and the unity of mankind. And, and uh, for this, uh, Radhakrishna uh, made it his task to reinterpret the great wisdom of ancient uh, India in modern terms and with a modern world perspective showing its truth and applicability even for today. So we culturally translating um, the spiritual legacy of uh, ancient India in a way that the people in the West or the peoples in the West are able to understand and appreciate. And for this Radhakrishnan so to draw uh, people's attention to the dimension of reality that gives rise to religion or religions the dimension that modern people have generally lost contact with. Uh, and that way uh, he sought to promote a religion of uh, the future. 
And in a way, Nakamura's dream, and he really uses the word dream, was to do something similar as a scholar of uh, uh, Buddhism and Eastern thought. So now I move to the third part, uh, contemporary relevance of what Nakamura called um, universal ideas. Nakamura sought to delineate uh, the universal ideas uh, which transcend the boundaries uh, of East and West. And the point here is to achieve what Gadama, great philosopher of hermeneutics, uh, referred to as a unity in diversity rather than global uniform uniformity. As uh, Gadama puts it, um, every culture, uh, every people has something distinctive to offer for the solidarity and welfare of humanity. And in a way, the attitude uh, that Nakamura took is very similar to this. Um, uh, this is one of the classic texts, uh, monumental books by Nakamura called Ways of Thinking of Eastern Peoples. And he here presents different peoples in the East think differently in India, China, Tibet, and Korea and Japan. And this, it is important to note that he writes ways of thinking, not way of thinking. And he also writes Eastern peoples and not Eastern people. So he really recognized a diversity in unity and also unity in diversity. Nakamura referred to the subject of his research as uh, universal ideas. And here, universal in two senses. Number one, uh, universal in the sense of a uh, concern, uh, uh, namely a uh, serious commitment to peoples outside of your own community and society, really in the sense of universalism, uh, universalistic ideas. And number two, in the universal in the sense of uh, appearance, um, um, namely that ideas that we can identify, find in the East and in the West. Right? So in other words, uh, uh, universal ideas, both in the sense of the, their content and commitment and also appearance and phenomenon. Now, along the features of what Nakamura calls or called universal ideas, uh, um, here are some uh, distinct features. Number one, an awareness about the transcendent nature of truth, awareness about the limits of human reason, tolerance and openness toward differences and mistakes, equality, solidarity, multifaceted rationalism. And among the examples of such universalism is uh, Shakamuni's teaching, Shakamuni's teaching. In, in Nakamura's view, what enables Shakamuni's teaching to be universal and universalistic is its underlying critical thinking as opposed to dogmatic thinking. And critical here in two senses, number one, not taking the traditional beliefs and conventional assumptions as given and as axiomatic. It's, uh, there's an openness and you allow yourself to question any assumptions and any beliefs or the legitimacy of uh, their legitimacy. And also cr critical in the sense of being aware of the limits of human understanding, namely what we can discuss, explain, by human reason and language and what we cannot. And what goes hand in hand with this critical thinking is um, the two senses of the world, of the word Dharma as truth. Dharma, the word uh, Dharma has many senses, but here Dharma as, tru as truth in two senses. Number one, Dharma as truth in the sense of the very reality of truth, which cannot be articulated in human categories, articulated with. And secondly, Dharma as truth 
<clears throat> in the sense of the teaching about that reality, which can be articulated or which is articulated in words or language. <clears throat> in other words, our, uh, our understanding always remains partial, always remains tentative, always uh, remain, uh, always remains uh, incomplete. And this recognition by starting with critical thinking and then understanding the, the transcendent nature of reality and truth, then this understanding or recognition promotes an attitude of openness and tolerance toward the differences and mistakes. Right? Dif different people may see different aspects of the same reality. Different people may uh, understand the same reality in the wrong way, right? because our understanding, human understanding is limited. Now, what are some of the um, existential insights according to Nakamura that peoples in the West can learn from the um, uh, uh, East? So Nakamura was not just uh, discussing universal ideas, but in, uh, he was also discussing in what way uh, people, especially in the West, peoples in the West can appreciate uh, the thinking, uh, ways of thinking in the East. And here I would mention three things, uh, logic and rationality. Number two, human solidarity and equality. Number three, the um, ultimate and the provisional or unity and diversity, unity and diversity. He also discussed other things, but uh, I see that uh, these three are really important, were well, really important for uh, Nakamura. I start with the first one, logic and rationality. Uh, Nakamura points out that when it comes to logic and rationality, um, Eastern traditions tend to take into account the multifaceted aspect of reality, an attitude that we see not only in, in Buddhism, Right, but also in Hinduism and J Jainism, and I would say also in traditional Judaism, you see also that in the Talmud. Talmud, right? and, uh, and contrastively in the West, the pro predominant approach rooted in part in Aristotle's logic is one dimensional. Right? There isn't much place for contradi contradiction and neither confirm nor deny. And here, what, uh, this is what Nakamura uh, writes. Aristotle's logic is valid when it concerns itself with issues and on the same level or domain, but it does not take into account issues on different domains. So for example, um, yeah, let me continue. Uh, contrastively, Buddhist logic involves a multi-dimensional, multi-faceted modes of thinking. What we need today is such modes of thinking. Truth has long, has long been deemed to be one dimensional. I think, however, that we must consider it from a multi-dimensional structural perspective. And, and such a multi-valent uh, or multi, how do I say, dimensional approach, uh, that we see in Shakyamuni and takes into account not only our intellectual, but also um, the other dimensions of human existence, such as the emotional aspect, the aesthetic aspect, the intuitive aspect, each of them, right? each of them has its own logic. Right? Such a, this kind of approach allows us to take a more nuanced approach to our differences and also to recognize the relative significance of ideologies and convictions. So ideology and convictions, they may be true on one level, but they may not be true on some other level or levels. So that's logic and rationality. Human solidarity and equality. While the commitment to the other and the stranger is common in the universal ideas of East and West, people in the East, or peoples in the East, especially, so uh, this is so among the Buddhists, tend to see the presence of the other, not as a challenge, 
as an entity that confronts you, but as part of the organic continuum to which I myself, you yourself belong. And it is important to uh, note that uh, this idea, and I see that very often people uh, misunderstand this idea by right? being part of uh, an organic continuum, uh, as uh, uh, people often, uh, I oftentimes hear that uh, this idea can efface our individuality, right? The Eastern concepts of us being part of an organic continuum efface our individual individuality? The answer is no, well, not necessarily. I would say that what uh, such concepts uh, uh, go against are the notion of individualism, but not of individuality. And here I'm uh, rely, relying on what uh, Jonathan Sachs, um, a great uh, Jewish uh, thinker, um, uh, explain the distinction between the two, individual, individualism and individuality. Uh, he said, individuality, individuality means that I am a unique and valued member of a team or a cosmic team in this case, right? Individualism means that I am not a team player at all. I am interested in myself alone, not the group. So I would say that the Buddhist notion of right, uh, us being part of an organic continuum will go against uh, the notion of individualism, but not the notion of individuality. Right? Being part of the whole doesn't mean that we lose our unique um, identity. Thirdly, uh, unity and diversity. Um, in Buddhism, in order to save the sentient beings, the reality of the ultimate or the cosmic dharma okay, can manifest itself through an immeasurable range of pro, uh, provisional corporeal forms. And uh, this idea we see also in Hinduism, uh, in Shinto as well, and other Asian uh, thoughts. And actually we, also see similar ideas in ancient, in ancient traditions of the West. And so for example, one of the church fathers, Clement of Alexandria, um, he says, if you look at the end of uh, this uh, statement, some of the Indians obey the precepts of Buddha, whom on account of his extraordinary sanctity, they have raised to divine honors. What he's talking about is the idea of logos, right? Logos as the reality of the ultimate. And that logos can manifest according to Clement as Jesus Christ. That logos can manifest itself as Jewish sages. And that logos according to Clement of Alexandria manifested itself as Buddha Shakyamuni. But in the West, uh, however, this kind of approach has eventually disappeared from the mainstream of its intellectual history. Whereas this kind of idea in the East has remained dominant. And according to Nakamura, um, this difference right, may be, uh, he says, this difference may be stemming from the fact that people in the West tend to put emphasis on the aspect of distinctions in the world of appearances, whereas peoples in Asia tend to direct the attention to that which is ultimate and lies behind the world of appearances. Now, by the way, uh, the statement of this kind uh, makes me wonder that uh, Tendai Buddhism <laughs> can actually offer a unique approach uh, for bridging or uh, being a bridge between the West and the East, right? Because the aspect of distinction uh, in the world of appearances, which uh, draw the attention of uh, peoples in the West, 
in a way corresponds to what we refer in Tendai as the provisional, provisional, whereas the ultimate which lies behind the world of appearances, uh, this corresponds to what we call the empty. <laughs> and um, bridging between the two <laughs> is the middle of what, what uh, this is the core of Tendai's uh, threefold um, teaching. So let me conclude. Uh, Nakamura uh, was, uh, well, he was deeply inspired by uh, Radhakrishnan. He was also different from Radhakrishnan in three respects. Number one, Radhakrishnan, he focused on the unity of religions and cultures or unity among religions and cultures, whereas Nakamura, uh, he focused on both both um, unity and also diversity among cultures, different cultures and religions. Number two, um, Radhakrishnan, as a religious thinker, he often uh, blurred the distinction between his own outlook and the outlook of the text or what he saw in the texts. Whereas Nakamura, as a scholar of comparative religion, kept the distinction clear. So one, uh, Radha Krishnan integrated his own, uh, his own thought to what he saw in Eastern ideas, whereas Nakamura really kept his own, own observational standpoint separate from the objects of his analysis. Number three, Radha Krishnan's primary concern was experiential aspects of uh, religious traditions. He talks about experience uh, a lot, experience of the ultimate dimension of reality how, and what it does to us. Whereas Nakamura, his focus was more on the content of religious ideas and thinking. And, and uh, in a way, Nakamura's scholarship can be uh, seen as a response in part to the following question. How can we liberate ourselves from our own perspective in order to enhance human coexistence in the global age? How can we liberate ourselves from our own perspective so that we can enhance human co coexistence in this global age? In other words, any idea any theology, any uh, ideology, any theory that we, we have about the world can diminish our ability to see what is in front of us. Right? It's supposed to, ideology is supposed to, is to uh, uh, help us see what, what is in front of us, but sometimes ideology can blind us, especially when we try to see things only through that lens, only through one paradigm. And so, Nakamura might say, start with critical thinking, understand the limits of human understanding, and see if and how opinions that are different from yours can actually enrich rather than threaten your quest for meaningful life. And expand accordingly your horizon to be as open-ended, open-minded, and pluralistic as possible. And for, and and why is it important? Right? Because as uh, uh, we say in Tendai Buddhism, you cannot catch a bird with a net that has only one mesh. A net, what catches the bird is always one mesh of a net. And the uh, bird here, you can understand in the sense of a glimpse of the true, nat true nature of reality. Thank you very much. <laughs>